Hello, my name is Brett from Blue Altitude. Today I'm going to give you a short presentation. I'm going to talk about the Certificate Rates Service, also known as the CRS. Now we use the CRS in an aviation environment to identify that the work for being carried out either on an aircraft or on a component has been completed and that that documentation itself is releasing the either the component or the uh, the aircraft back to the service and that is done by or accomplished by a authorized uh, engineer now so what does the crs actually mean well if you ask a lot of people they may indicate that the crs confirms that that part or component is serviceable and yes we understand that that yes it is serviceable but what does it actually mean well to understand this when a person signs that documentation really they're making a statement to confirm that the component or the, uh, the aircraft is serviceable however there are six things really that that individual should have taken into account now next i'm just going to go through those six points that the authorized engineer should take into account when he's completed that work at the same time i'll maybe highlight some sort of things that you may need to consider that may impair or lower the standard expected for that crs itself so firstly the first one then to work through our six points is competent and competencies so do i have the current or recent skills knowledge experience uh, to carry out a task so therefore am i authorized to do that now within the regulatory requirements they talk about a thing called recency so ideally in order to carry that work you must have at least six months recency within every two year period if you haven't done that and you've not been familiar with the aircraft type or the component beyond that sort of two year period then really your authorization is invalid it needs to be updated or you need some sort of refresh training to continue that next we have uh, number two which talks about the using the correct approved data now the data itself is the data that's been provided by the original equipment manufacturer that's the OEM or it could have been provided by an other approved quantified source now that would have been determined by the quality department as being acceptable to be used by the organization it should be down to the engineer to identify that that information should be quantified by the organization itself so for example would be uh, a modification uh, it could be something to do with the part 21 that's the uh, production of a of the design for example that you may use to support that uh, maintenance activities the other thing to maybe consider really when we look at stuff uh, in regards to this approved data is have we accurately recorded what we've been doing on the aircraft so that would include things recording items like that, that we've removed that we've installed that we've fitted maybe that we've replaced thinking about the part number batch number and serial number and so on and then we also need to consider the other requirements for example functional checks operational checks now those two items and those terms mean different things a functional check is not an operational check you need to understand the difference there may be a requirement to do what we call independent inspections there may be a requirement to do close out inspections there may be a requirement to do ground runs or other leak checks or whatever that requires and then there may be a requirement to do a maintenance check flight so you can see as the crs you are still responsible if you sign that document to ensure that you actually signposted or recorded what other maintenance activities are required to be carried out to fulfill the whole job or the whole task in its entirety if you've just done one specific part next we have number three which is talks about tooling and equipment so really the tooling we're thinking about is the tool calibrated is it controlled tooling do we need to book it in or return it back into stores uh, what about our personal tooling how do we account for our personal tooling? Do we have like an adventure list? How do we know we've accounted for all our tooling? Is the tooling that we're using serviceable? Regards to equipment, we need to think about aspects of staging, the steps, anything that help us that would facilitate us using that piece of tooling uh, or doing that maintenance activity itself. 
So, for example, if we were using a tool that was not calibrated or just gone out of calibration, and therefore we are risking the quantity or the standard of the CRS that we're going to issue with the aircraft. Likewise, if we use a piece of or steps to help uh, gain access to uh, the engine cal uh, the engine uh, compartment, for example, and that wasn't very sturdy or was very you couldn't really trust whether that's a safe piece of equipment to use, then that would impair your capability to actually release the aircraft because your behaviour and attitude would speed up and change and you would think about your personal safety, not of completing the task uh, on the, you know, within an adequate sort of frames or boundaries. You'd be rushing, you'd be nervous, you won't be actually thinking about doing it to a high standard, you'd be doing it as quickly as possible to mitigate the risk to yourself. Next we've got number four, which looks at the suitable working conditions. So within this, we're thinking about anything that may affect the human factor principles, so the things that may affect my performance, your performance, and anything that may affect my capabilities, your capabilities, and the things that would normally do this immediately would be anything to do with heating, lighting, uh, am I wearing suitable clothing, indoor that indoors, for example, in the hangar environment, or what about when I'm working outside? Do I have adequate clothing and protection to keep yourself warm, gloves, hat, jacket, waterproofs? These are things that I must be able to be satisfied with. For example, if I was outside working in sub-zero temperatures and I don't have any gloves, then therefore my ability to carry out that, for example, wheel change or the tyre change would be inadequate. It would be compromised straight away. So therefore, why should I be reaching an aircraft back into service when I don't have the suitable equipment to do the task? It's going to be impaired, right? Next, we need to think about the components. Now, when I say about the approved data, I'm referring to what we call the illustrated particle log, the IPC. So, we need to think about you know, the details, for example, the modification status if required, the serial number effectivity, if applicable or as applicable. And then the form one that we receive with the component, does that match what's actually in my hand? So does the description of the component actually match what I've got in my hand on the documentation we reference? When I say a form one, it could be another release document, authorised release documentation, for example, an FAA 8130. It could be a Transport Canada form one, as an example. Things that may be serialised. So we need to try and match it up to satisfy ourselves as listed in the IPC for that part of components, it's actually applicable. I should have said at the beginning, really, components includes parts, materials, it could be uh, an engine, it could be a propeller or an appliance. So like an appliance would be like a display unit or another piece of equipment inside the cockpit, as an example. So you need to account for those items correctly uh, and use what it says within the approved data again. Number six, and really this is the last of the, of the sort of items to think about, is the loose article check. So, so we're looking at really, I'm thinking about in our heads, FOD, tooling, but again, or I should say tooling, materials, panels being refitted, clearance inspection. So let's just think of this for example. FOD, we make sure that we've left nothing behind is the first sort of check. There's no other sort of loose items or debris that can cause damage to the aircraft. I've not left any tooling behind, that's the importance. Make sure I account for my own personal tooling, and likewise, we've not left anything fitted to the aircraft, which has happened in the past. Materials, we don't leave any loose materials lying around. We've accounted for our lubricants, the greases, the solvents, the rags we may use. Anything that shouldn't be there, we've got it, we've moved it safely, and we've disposed of it accordingly. Now, regards to panels fitted, well, have we disturbed or removed any panels during that maintenance input? If we have, and we remove the maintenance panel, which should be documented in, for example, in our approved data, uh, we spoke about number two. So we remove the panel, we've done some, uh, some maintenance inspections or tasks, we may have removed something, maybe disturbed something. So you must ensure before we refit that panel, that we're satisfied that everything is safe, nothing's been disturbed, or we've reconnected everything and we have disturbed accordingly. And likewise, that may need what we call a clearance inspection. So that may need not only just your set of eyes to look at it, it may need a second pair of eyes. So you need a colleague, another supervisor, another mechanic, for example, to come along and inspect the area to make sure, yes, we're good to go before we refit that panel. The main, port, the main important thing to consider 
we must fulfill in that requirement the uh, part 145.a.48, which talks about the performance maintenance. We must take account for our tooling, materials, and panels being refitted. Because there's been numerous instances and accidents caused where we've left things behind, we've not fitted the panels, uh, and so on. So that's important. So, just to summarise then, really, of those six points for you to consider. When you next sign that certificate of service, in your head, make a mind note or make a note that what you need to take into account. And let's just summarise again over that. Let's go over these. Firstly, am I authorised to do that task at hand? Number two, have I used the correct sort of approved data? That's important. Number three, have I used the correct tooling and equipment to carry on that task at hand? Number four, have I used the suitable work conditions? You know, have I attired and supported for that? Got the correct lighting? Got the correct uh, heating and so on. Remember, you can't inspect something in the dark. You need adequate lighting. Think about your age, just get older, you need better lighting, maybe. So, something to consider. Number five, components. Have I used the correct component as specified in the IPC, in the Illustrated Parts Catalog? Number six is the loops article check. You know, have I accounted for all my tools, all the materials, everything I've used, have I refit the panel? Is it documented? That's great, job done. The final thing, really, is signing the CRS. Sign that document only takes place when numbers one through to six have been completed. You do not sign the CRS when you're halfway through numbers one through to six. Otherwise, it's not complete. It's not a CRS. You've inadequately done that. So therefore, you've compromised what the CRS means. The CRS means that you've done items one through to six. If you choose to do items one through to five, and therefore you've compromised the CRS itself. And therefore that would cause an incident or an accident and may result in some sort of injury or an event taking place. So we've come to the end now. I'd like to think that you should have a really good understanding of what the CRS means. It's not serviceable. It, sorry, I should say it doesn't mean it's just serviceable. It means those six points I've just shown you, a combination of them. It needs all them not just half of them or a few of them. It needs all of them to be our CRS and be an effective standard of requirements. If you have any sort of questions about this sort of short little presentation, then please get in touch. You can either do that by the telephone number on the, on the screen, or you can email us, or you can contact us via our website, via the contact us page. Likewise, again, if you have any comments, then post it on the uh, feedback below. I'd like to hear your sort of comments, good or bad, 